and he has a lot of expertise and a lot of knowledge on this topic. Uh, he's dealt with so many communities and so many people. Uh, so inshallah, we can use that uh, experience that he has and knowledge uh, to benefit tremendously, inshallah. So I'm just going to give him a brief intro. Um, as you can see, the program is, is being conducted by the ICNA Council of Social Justice. He's been working with them for five years, mashallah. He's the Director of Communications and Outreach. He graduated in 2008 with a BS in Information Technology. He also graduated in 2017 with a BA in Islamic Studies. Ramiz worked in the IT field from 2008 to 2014. In 2014, he became Director of Communication and Outreach for ICNA's Council for Social Justice. Ramiz initially joined ICNA as a volunteer in 2008 on various projects, including as a community organizer and fundraiser. He served as the youth coordinator for two years and then as the president of the ICNA Mosque in Alexandria, Virginia, for two more years before joining ICNA Council for Social Justice in 2014. Also a fun fact, um, can I say it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he worked for DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security. So he, he got the job right out of college with HP. And little did he know that that work would, would be contracted out to the government, DHS. Uh, so, yeah, that's a fun fact. Yeah. So don't be scared of him, uh, but he does have some uh, crazy level access, I heard, in the government. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a clarification. I used to work for Homeland Security. Not anymore. Now I'm full-time ICNA, non-profit work. I left the IT world five years ago. Okay, uh, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited. Uh, this is actually the third workshop I'm giving in this, uh, in the Dallas area. I just did two yesterday. And uh, this was the, this is my last one today before my flight back to uh, Washington, D.C. later tonight, inshallah. And I hope the rain stops so I can go back on time and my flight is not delayed. Um, okay, so uh, inshallah, so we're going to talk about anti-bullying. Uh, my understanding is you have had this class here before, but I'm hoping to bring a new perspective to it, a little bit more practical advice and not just theory and academic and you know, long, you know, boring discussion over it, but something more engaging, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's begin. Okay, so what is bullying? So can somebody tell me, what is bullying? Yes. Okay, he said fight you and stuff. So I want the definition. That's a type of bullying. I want you to give me a definition. So my, my presentation is in two parts. First part, the first 45 minutes, I only, I'm talking to the kids. And the second 45 minutes, I'll be talking to the parents, inshallah. Okay, yes. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, that's also a type. So give me a definition. I want you to give me a definition. How do you define bullying? Yes. Huh? I can't hear you. Roasting? Roasting? I don't even know what that means. Is that, is that a new thing? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, not, yes, last one. Okay, again, that's a type of bullying. Okay. So bullying is three things. There are three things must take place for something to be considered bullying according to most experts. So it's three things. If any one of these three things is missing, then it's not called bullying. It might be harassment, it might be something else, but it's not bullying. So number one is uh, it's unwanted aggressive behavior that includes three things. Number one is hostile intent and not an accident. Meaning that the person who's doing the bullying, he wants to hurt the person. They want to psychologically or physically harm the person. They want to inflict some sort of pain on the person. That's their intention. It's not a miscommunication. It's not an accident. They actually want to do that to the person. That's the first condition. Second condition is imbalance of power. What do you think that means? What is the imbalance of power? Okay, the bully has more power, yes. Can somebody be more specific? You haven't raised your hand yet, yes. Yeah. Oh, you have? Okay, I have a bad memory then. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so like when the bully is like going overboard by like being too, like a little too much than he's Okay, one more try. Anything else? When he doesn't really get in trouble from like laughing or like stopping. Okay, you're all close, you're all close. So imbalance of power basically means that the bully has some sort of uh, power over the victim and somehow he's, there's something in him 
that makes the victim not be able to compete with him. It might be physical strength. So maybe the bully is physically stronger than the victim. Okay? That might be one. Or it could be something, or maybe the bully has some sort of access to some personal information. Okay? He says, if you don't, I know, so, I know such and such thing about you. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to tell everyone if that you have this. It might be some, maybe it might be an embarrassing picture. It might be something related to your family. Whatever it is, but it's basically, uh, they have some information. Or it could be popularity as well. Because if, you, if, if a bully is popular, that means he has social influence, right? There are a lot of people who follow him or her, right? So, this, he, so that, that in itself is a power. Okay? A bully can have a power. So a bully might not be physically stronger than the victim, but because of his or her popularity, that is power itself. And, it, and it's, there's the imbalance. And because of that, the one becomes the victim and the other one becomes uh, the bully. And the last condition is repetition, meaning it happens again and again and again. It might be weekly, it might be monthly, but the point is it doesn't stop. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. If it only happens once, then it's not considered bullying. It might be harassment or something else, but it wouldn't be considered bullying uh, according to uh, most academics. Okay, now we get to the types. So give me the types of bullying. No, no, no. Give me there are like four main categories. Yes. Huh? Yeah, that's the but give me the the broader category. Huh? Calling people again, yeah, this, those are all types of bullying, yes, definitely. Yes. Okay, he's closer. So the first one is verbal. So basically uh, what, what do you think that means, right? Anything basically you do with the tongue. So teasing, name calling, inappropriate comments, taunting or threatening. Anything you do with the tongue to hurt someone else's feelings, either psychologically, or, or mostly psychologically, or emotionally to hurt them, then that's verbal bullying. The second one is social bullying. What do you think social bullying means? What is social bullying? How do you socially bully someone? Anyone from the sister side? Yes. I'm sorry, louder. Louder. Okay, when you do it in front of a big crowd, come closer so I can hear you, inshallah, okay? Yes. Okay, anything else? Last try. Yes. Mm, close. Yes, last one. Okay, well, we'll get to that one. That's a good one too. So basically, it's leaving someone out on purpose. What does that mean, leaving someone out on purpose? How do you bully someone by leaving someone out on purpose? <coughs> right, right. So a popular example of this is, for example, somebody says, you can come to my party, you can come to my party, you can come to my party, you can't, you can come to my party. You see what happens? I intentionally excluded that person from the invitation, right? Or you can come to my house, you can come to my house, but you can't, you can come to my house. That's, that's called social bullying, okay? Because the person's intent is to hurt that person, okay? They want to hurt their feelings, okay? So that's why that's social bullying. Uh, another one is spreading rumors or embarrassing or, or trying to embarrass someone in public, trying to embarrass someone in public. This is called social bullying. The last one is physical. So last one is physical bullying, okay? And this is, you know, this is probably everyone knows about. Uh, uh, it's uh, hitting, spitting, pushing, tripping, anything basically physically involved is called uh, physical bullying. Okay, the next one is cyberbullying. What is cyberbullying? Okay, okay, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so basically, everything, everything that we just discussed, but it happens in the digital world, okay? It happens on the internet, okay? It could be via, uh, it could be, it, it could be, it could be via social media, okay? Like Facebook, Twitter, okay? Texting on the phone, forums, uh, gaming, okay? Uh, and also includes things like sharing personal or private information about someone, sharing false, negative, harmful, or mean content about someone online. So basically, everything that we just talked about, mainly verbal, trying to hurt someone, but you're doing it in the digital realm. You're doing it online or some other feature using the internet. Okay, so students' most risk of being bullied. So, uh, so in this 
slide, I discuss, so every, basically bullies have certain qualities that they're looking for in their victims, okay? Bullies have certain qualities. So that, this doesn't mean it's the victim's fault. It means that, generally speaking, bullies are looking for very specific types of people to pick on. A bully doesn't pick on everyone in the school. They're very specific people. And these are the qualities that most likely attract a bully towards their victims. So the first one is students who are perceived to be different from their peers. So any child who's somehow different from other ones, he's not as cool as the other one, he's, he's, maybe he's overweight, maybe she's new, okay? Or maybe don't dress like everyone else. They're somehow different from the majority, okay, of the members of that school body. So then they are more likely to get picked on and be bullied by someone, okay? Another one is students belonging to an ethnic or religious minority. Okay, we, are, we hear about this one all the time, right? Like a Muslim sister who wears a hijab in public schools, she gets her hijab pulled off. Or a um, Muslim kid in school who's brown, he, he gets called a terrorist, right? We hear about these kind of cases all the time, right? And it's because of this, because they're ethnically or they're uh, uh, religious minorities in their school district. Same thing happens with African-American kids who are in a predominantly white school, so they might get picked on as well because of the color of their skin. So the point is they're, so, they're ethnically or religiously different uh, minorities. Uh, students perceived to be weak or have low self-esteem. Now, this is very important, okay? First of all, some, give me a definition of self-esteem. What does self-esteem mean? What is self-esteem? What is the meaning of self-esteem? Anyone? Okay, self-esteem basically means how someone feels about themselves, okay? So kids who have very low self-esteem, okay, meaning they have a very bad opinion about themselves. They have a very low opinion of who they are as a person. Okay, I'm too fat. I'm too ugly. I'm not smart enough. I'm, whatever. The, if somebody feels that way, if a child feels that way, then they are more likely to get picked on by a bully. And also kids who have less self-confidence. If you kids have less, if, if a child has less uh, low self-esteem, they're automatically going to have also a less lack of self-confidence as well. Why do, you think, why do you think that this is a quality that a bully loves in their victims? Why do you think? This particular quality, yes. Yes, because the person will always say it's true. Like, yeah, maybe he is right. I am like this. I am, I am too fat. I am too ugly. I am too this. I am too that. Anything else? Why is this such an attractive quality for a bully to pick on the victim? They have no one to defend them. Okay. Anything else? Give me one more. From the sister side? Okay. <laughs> yes, they won't fight back, right? They won't stand up for themselves. They just keep taking it and taking it and taking it. They won't do anything about it. So a bully loves that quality in their victim. Okay? And we'll talk about how to raise, uh, in the parent section, how to raise... Uh, self-confident children. Students who have few friends or who are unpopular. Obviously, if they don't have some social support in the background, then they're more likely to get picked on as well. Okay, so these are most common qualities that a bully looks for in their victims. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna talk about why kids bully. Why would a, one human being make another human being feel miserable? Like, what's, well, why would you someone do that? Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about, what this, uh, why kids like to do that. Um, the most common reason is that it's a lack of attention from parents at home, uh, so they lash it out. Meaning, what is that? It means that all children, they, they want attention from their parents. That's, that's common. And those who are parents in this room, they know that, right? Your children want attention, okay? And if you don't give it to them, they try to get it from elsewhere. So a lot of time what happens is that children who are at home and they don't get proper attention from their parents, the only way that they have learned to get attention from their parents is by lashing out, getting in trouble, breaking things, getting into fights at home. That's the only way they've learned to get attention. So when they come to school, they basically exhibit the same behavior because that's the only way they know how to get attention. So one reason is because they don't have enough good, healthy attention at home, so they try to get it elsewhere at school. Unstable home environment. So somebody tell me, what does that mean? Unstable home environment. Yes. Okay, so some sort of a, uh, like rivalry in the house. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So you said they're always changing house or the parents are going through a divorce. Yes, so basically 
children get stressed out, okay? They get stressed out. So, for example, it could also be economic pressure. Maybe, this, maybe the family is going through some sort of a poverty. Uh, the, lo- the, jo- the, the dad lost his job, and now the kid is working like eight hours a day under, you know, like uh, under the table getting money at a restaurant, and he's always like stressed out, okay? So now when they go to school, he's basically lashing out because of the stress, okay? And it could be because of family problems as well. The parents are fighting with each other. There's, a, there's like, there's no harmony in the house, and the kid is stressed out. So when he goes to school, he's basically going to pick on other kids because, because of the stress that he feels. He doesn't feel, whole, he doesn't feel, he or she doesn't, they don't feel comfortable in their own home. So that might be another, another reason. Another reason is uh, bad role models. Um... I should uh, uh, skip the one. Uh, so vi- no, no, go back. <laughs> a victim of bullying themselves. Maybe even from another old. So sometimes the kid is a victim of a bully him or herself. Maybe somebody was bullying them. So now they want to bully other kids as well. And sometimes the bully is actually the older brother or older sibling or older sister. Okay? And then when they go to school, they want to do the same thing that's happening to them in their house by their older brother or sister. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. It could be someone else too. I, met, I actually met a gentleman at an anti-bullying conference, he told me that, um, actually he was telling all of us, that uh, when he was in elementary school, uh, he basically, he was severely uh, bullied in elementary school so much that when he went to middle school, he basically started bullying other kids as well. He, he learned it from middle school. So that might be one reason. Another reason is bad role models. So sometimes kids look up to other kids. Okay, so if if maybe the father uh, is a bully in the community, maybe he picks on other adults. Maybe the way he talks about other people, and, and uh, you know, like you know, like we find all these like kids, and nowadays in schools who make all these racial comments about children who are black or children, Muslims, for example, or you guys are all terrorists. Where is that coming from? It's not. It's not. It's learned behavior, right? Kids don't just get up one day and say, "I don't like black kids." That, 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 it doesn't happen like that. Well, I don't like Muslims, okay, they're all terrorists. Where is that coming from? How does a seven, seven eight-year-old kid make that type of statement? It's because their father is more likely at home or their mom more likely at home is saying that statement. They're teaching that, that attitude to their children. So it's learned behavior. So they have bad role models at home. And that's what's causing them to come to school and do the same thing. Because children at that young age, they don't come to such conclusions unless you teach it to them. Um... Aggressive and dominating by nature. So some kids are maybe they're, they're very aggressive and mean by nature. And some, for that, maybe they need therapy, they need counseling. But some kids are just like that. Another reason is to fit in or be accepted. So we, uh, so we find this type of stuff all the time, all right? Like a kid gets in trouble for bullying. Why did you bully that kid? Oh, my friends dared me to do it. Oh, everybody was doing it. Oh, they pushed me to do it. They forced me to do it. You know, things like that. So if they have, they have bad company, the people that they're hanging out with, they're also bullying other kids. So in order to be accepted in that environment, they also have to bully other kids. So that's why they bully. And sometimes it's also just jealousy. Some kids are just jealous. How dare he get a better grade than me? Why is he, why is he a better player than me? Okay? Uh, so sometimes it's just jealousy. Why is she prettier than me? Okay? So whatever it might be. Okay, why do they have such and such clothes and I don't have them? So it might be just jealousy sometimes. Uh, keep others from bullying them. So sometimes kids are so scared of being bullied themselves so they, and they're so insecure about themselves or they want to be liked so badly and they think people will not like them unless they cause trouble, unless they have that I'm a bad, I'm a really bad person type of attitude around the school. They will say, oh, okay. Uh, if they don't, if, basically, they, this is the only way they, they see it fulfilled by actually picking on other kids. So they're so insecure about themselves that the only way they find security is by picking on other kids. Uh, okay, so view violence positively. What does that mean? This is an interesting one. They view violence positively. What does that mean? Yes. Yes, yes. So basically, they view violence positively. This is where that whole debate about violent video games and movies and TV shows comes from, okay? There's a big debate. That, is this real? Does this happen? Uh, is it doable or not? But there is evidence to suggest that kids who are very young, because their brains haven't completely developed, they cannot tell the difference between reality and what's fake and what's not. So that's why... Uh, you know, in school, a lot of times you find like these kids who are bullying each other. They're like huge fans of WWF, WCW, and things like that. And they're trying to do the same exact stuff 
in school on other kids that they see on television because their minds cannot process it properly. So when a child is exposed to violent behavior for a long time in movies, video games, or TV shows, and they cannot tell the difference, they think it's okay. When an adult watches something violent on screen, they know this is fake, this is not real, okay? This is complete, this is all like computer animated or it's like, you know, camera tricks and stuff like that, but a child cannot tell that difference. They cannot tell that difference. So, so there is merit to this argument that yes, long exposure to these things could cause a child to become a bully because they're trying to imitate that behavior. Uh, last one I have here is a have difficulty following rules. So some kids, uh, maybe it might be because of uh, some sort of mental illnesses or maybe some other reasons, uh, they have a really hard time following rules. They just don't know how to follow rules properly. And again, they need counseling or they may need therapy or something like that. So these are the most common reasons why kids bully other kids that, I've, that we've come across. Okay, effects of being bullied. So there's a big stigma. People think that bullying is just like part of you know, childhood and there's no harm, no, no foul. It's just like something you grow up with. That's not true. Uh, research has shown that bullying has a very, very negative impact on children. Sometimes a long-term impact. I've, I, I, uh, again, at another anti-bullying conference, we met this gen gentleman. He wrote a book. I forgot the name. But he wrote a book on bullying. But he was very severely bullied when he was a kid. Until this day, he's on medication because of the psychological harm that bullying caused him as a child. And he's on medication till this day because of it. He has, he has psychological issues because of the trauma that bullying causes. I think you're going way ahead. <laughs> but it's fine. Just leave it here. That's fine. So, kids who are bullied, uh, they are more likely to be depressed. Kids who are bullied, they are more likely to suffer for, uh, from anxiety, feelings of sadness, loneliness, changes in eating and sleeping patterns. So, meaning sometimes bullying is so bad that it actually changes the behavior of the child. Their eating patterns change. Their sleeping patterns change. So as parents, that's one of the things that we should, should uh, watch out for, you know? Your kid completely changes his eating or sleeping patterns and you take him to the doctor and the doctor says he's completely okay. And you ask your child and your kid doesn't want to talk about it. So there might be, a, there might be something going on at school. Decreased academic performance. So your kid is a straight-A student. And so all of a sudden, a few months later, they're having like C's and D's and, you can't, and they can't, and they don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And they can't explain it. So it might be something's going on or happening at school. So that's something to look out for as well. Uh, loss interest in activity they used to enjoy. So your kid comes to you, I want to join soccer. You put him on the soccer team. Two weeks later, I hate soccer. I never want to go back again. What happened? I don't want to talk about it. It might be a sign something happened on the field. Something happened on the field. That's probably what it is. And again, this is something for parents to look out for. Now, there's a very small percentage, very small percentage of children who retaliate by violence, meaning they've been bullied for a while, they go home, they get a gun, they come to school, and they start shooting everyone, okay? It's a very small percentage. Most kids who are bullied, they don't go to this level. Or they just keep it to themselves. They just basically inhale it. But the, there's a very small percentage that does react violently. And almost all cases that I've come up with, or at least most cases that we've heard about, all these, you know, like the Parkland shooting in Florida, uh, or the Columbine, and a few other ones too, though all those kids were bullied. They, everybody knew that these kids were constantly bullied in school. Okay, so that's something to think about as well. So all of these are impacts because of bullying. So we have to get rid of this idea that bullying doesn't have any impact on children. And like I said earlier, that it actually follows you into adulthood. And some people have psychological problems, emotional problems. They can't connect with people. They can't, have, they can't trust people even into adulthood because of the trauma that was caused by bullying. So it's a very serious issue and it should be taken seriously. Okay, so now we get to the crux of the matter, okay? What to do if you're actually bullied? So some kids tell me, what, do you, what should you do? Yes. Okay, he says, uh, take self-defense, okay? What else? Okay, walk the other way, meaning avoid the bully, okay? Tell a teacher or a parent, good, good. Last one. Yes, yeah, good. Oh, you were going to say that? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so number one thing you need to understand when it comes to this issue, that the number one thing that a bully is looking for is a reaction, okay? They're looking for a reaction. 
And if you don't give them a reaction, they will lose interest, okay? You know what the bully is looking for? They're looking for you. They want to see fear in your eyes, okay? They want to see you sweat. They want to see you shiver, okay? They want, they, that's what they're looking for. And if you don't give them that reaction that, you're, that their comments are not hurting you, okay, and they're not impacting you, then they'll just get bored of you and move on to someone else because you're not entertaining, okay? So that's the number one thing we need to understand, that they are looking for a reaction. And don't give them that any type of reaction. Like, just let it roll off you like it doesn't even bother you, okay? Uh, next thing we need to understand you, need, you must tell the bully to stop in a calm and clear voice. Stop. Why is that important, by the way? Why is this important? Why should you tell a bully to stop, to stop in a calm, confident, and a clear voice? Yes. So he doesn't what? Okay. Anything else? You haven't spoken yet. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. That, that makes sense. Okay, yes. Oh, okay, okay. So here's the thing. Let's say something happens. You both get called, uh, the bully and the victim, right? They both get called to the, uh, to the, to the principal's office, right? The first thing the bully is going to say to the principal after he said, why were you picking on him? Why did you say that to him? Oh, I was just joking. He didn't tell me to stop. She didn't tell me to stop. I was just kidding around. If it, if it bothered him so much, why didn't say anything? So this is... So basically, you're communicating to the bully that you don't appreciate that behavior, that you need to stop. I don't appreciate that behavior. Stop. So, so, what, so in case you do get to call to the, to the principal's office, you can say, hey, I did tell him or her to stop, but this continue to do it anyway. And then the, the principal asks him or her, did, you tell, did he tell you to stop? And there, obviously, there will be witnesses, right? There will be witnesses. So he, they will ask you, did you tell him to stop? And, he will, and the teacher will ask, and the principal will also ask the witnesses, did he tell him to stop? Yes, he did. But he still continued. So, that's, so it's basically a self-protection. And com so there's no miscommunication on the bully part, okay? The so bully doesn't say, well, I didn't know. Because if he really is sincere, or she really is sincere, that they would have stopped, they would stop. So that's why you need to know, in the, this is the first step, okay? To tell the bully to stop. Now, obviously, this only works if you don't... If, so some bullies are very, very aggressive, and the victim might feel that if I tell him or her to stop, they might, you know, they may, they might get scared, they might feel that he might physically attack them, then obviously, then you do other something else, and we'll get to that in a minute, inshallah. Okay, you can also try to laugh it off. Uh, so why is this... Why would this work? Why would, if you like... So some... Um, you know, when I first came across this, I thought, that can't be right. But then I, then I remembered when I was in high school, this is how I dealt with it, and it always worked for me. Okay, so this is it. Basically, you try to laugh it off. Why does this work? By the way, it doesn't work in every case, but it, 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 it is a good suggestion. Why, why, why would this work? Trying to laugh it off and joke it off. Why would that work? Okay, you're not, you're, he, he knows that you will not get mad, okay? So, remember the first point? It's connected to the first point, yes. Wait, uh, I was going to say that connected to the first point. I was going to say that it's like, it's giving him a positive reaction instead of a negative reaction. Okay, positive, yeah. He's looking for a negative reaction. You're giving a positive one. Meaning, you're not reacting. He won't, he, remember what I told you? He wants to see fear. He wants you to shiver. He wants you to feel uncomfortable, Okay. And if he's not getting that and you're laughing it off like it's a joke, then you're not giving him the reaction that he wants. That's why this works. And you know, a lot of comedians, a lot of like John Stewart, for example, Ben Stiller, uh, or, Chris, uh, or Chris Rock even, and a lot of them, they, always, they all say that when we were kids, we were bullied. Okay? And comedy was a way for them to get out of bullying situations. Okay? So I see the, uh, there were some studies done as well that a lot of these comedians, when they were kids, they were actually very much bullied as kids. And comedy was a way for them to get out of bullying situations. So they came out to be very successful comedians. That's just a side note. But the point is that the reason this is recommended in guides is because uh, it's not the reaction that the bully wants. Yes? So when you're giving like that principal example, like if you're called to the principal, what if like the witnesses, they're like a friend of the bully and they go against you? 
Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're most likely there will be more uh, witnesses. If there are not, I mean, that will be a very unique situation. But then you have to present your side to the best of your ability. And, the, and then it's the principal's responsibility to dig into it deep as possible. Uh, but, but usually what the principal does is they will isolate. They won't put them all in the same room. They'll isolate all of them separately. And all, always some one of them says, okay, you know what, yeah, because they don't want to get in trouble. Because they might feel very strong around the bully, but when you separate him from his friends, they become weak again. Okay, so that's something to remember. Okay, um, okay, so if, okay, now, according, remember I said earlier that if the bully is very aggressive, then there's something else you need to do. So here it is. Um, if speaking up seems too hard or not safe, walk away and stay away. Don't fight back. Find an adult to stop the bullying on the spot. Yeah, so if the bully is very aggressive, then you need to leave the situation. Don't say anything. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Okay. That was fun. That was part of the plan, by the way. <laughs> okay, so if speaking up, so basically, so don't say anything. Just walk away. Okay? Don't say anything. Don't make a comment. Don't look at him or her. Just, just, just like, just let them talk whatever they're saying, whatever comments they're making, and just walk away. And if you think he's going to get aggressive, then immediately go to an adult and make a complaint that you know, this person is harassing me or this person is bullying me, uh, and to tell a teacher, okay? Uh, if bullying, now, if none of the fault above works, uh, if bullying continues, then talk to a trusted adult. What is a trusted adult? Give me a definite. What is a trusted adult? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Exactly. That's a trusted adult. A trusted adult is someone that you know will take care of the situation. And unfortunately, I, I, I'm, it's unfortunate that most Muslim kids do not think parents are one of those. You know, I used to, I used to teach um, at a Sunday school for 10 years. So I did a building workshop with them. So, you know, this is like small classroom, and they know me for many years now. I've been working with them. So there's no, their, their parents aren't around, no other teachers are around, just me and the kids. That's it. And they're all, they're all in high school, by the way, middle and high school. So I asked them, there are like 40 of them in the class. I said, okay, honestly speaking, if any of who in here, if they were bullied, they would tell their parents. 80% said they will not tell their parents. And when I, so majority of these kids said they will not share that information with their parents. Why? One of two reasons. They said, number one, oh no, I'm telling you what they actually said. <laughs> number one, they said, is because my parents will not do anything. They will just say, ignore it, okay? And we'll talk about that in the parents section. Why is that a horrible response to give to your kids? Number one, they said, because my parents will not take it seriously. They'll say, tell me to ignore it. Or they said, my parents will make a, such a circus out of it. Okay, they'll get so freaked out. They'll come to my school. They'll like set up a whole show. Like, who dare touch my child? Meaning they'll embarrass me. Okay, they'll even embarrass me even more. I'll become like a laughing stock at the school. So meaning they don't want these extreme reactions from their parents. Okay, they want them to have a professional uh, response to the problem and a rational one and we'll talk about in the parent section what they can do inshallah but that's it but that, that's a very sad situation that your own children don't trust you you're not a trusted adult to them they are more likely to tell their friends they said they said they were more likely to tell a peer and their friends than they would tell their parents so talk to a trusted adult so someone who will actually take care of the situation especially obviously if you are being physically bullied or are in danger then obviously it makes more sense yes I have a whole section about tattletaling coming up, so I'll talk about that. But that's not what they told me. That's not the reason. It's because, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is one of the reasons as well. We'll talk about it later. But in this classroom that I did the survey in, that's what they told me. Okay. Uh, next. Okay, so some examples I have here is teacher, parent, guidance counselor, or school uh, psychologist. It could also be a security guard. I gave this class in Virginia. And there was, a, there was a kid there, and he was telling me that he was very severely also, he was also bullied when he was in high school. And he said that no one helped me, no teacher, no one, no one would help me. There was only one security guard at the school who helped him and stood up for him and ended the situation, basically resolved the problem. So it could be anyone. But the, but the point is that it's somebody who will actually get something done, okay, and make sure they'll protect them, and they'll get, they'll, they will protect you, and they will make sure that the situation is resolved. 
Okay, another method is avoiding the bully. This can be done in one of two ways. Uh, stay away from places where bullying happens. Somebody mentioned this earlier. So sometimes bullies, they only like to hang out in certain areas of the school. That's like their spot, okay? So the logical thing to do is avoid that spot. Don't you go to that spot, okay? Just go from somewhere else. Uh, stay near adults and other kids if it happens when alone. So some bullies, they only pick on kids when they're alone by themselves, but if they're with somebody else or whether they're, they're an adult, they, they leave them alone. So in that situation, then what the child should do is they should either get a buddy system, have some friends with them to go with them together so they're not alone, or have an adult with them whenever they walk so, they, so that the bully does not bother them. Okay, what not to do when bullied, okay? Uh, so these are things that you absolutely never, ever do. Okay? This is not okay to do. Okay, go ahead. Okay? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. Same thing, but yes. Number one, think it's your fault. Okay, nobody deserves to be bullied. You should never, ever think that you deserve to be bullied. Maybe I am ugly. Maybe I am overweight. Maybe I am, you know, this. Maybe I am that. No, absolutely. It is not your fault for being picked on. That's the number one thing you, need, you must understand. The bully is the one who's wrong. You're not wrong. Number two, fight back or bully a person back. So just because the bully is bullying you does not mean that you should bully them as well, okay? And fighting back, I'm obviously talking about physically, but meaning don't get violent with a bully because you could get severely hurt, okay? So don't uh, also get violent with the bully itself. It's not worth it, especially if he's much stronger than you. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay, keep it, your, keep it to yourself and just hope that the bullying will go away. It will never go away. If you keep it to yourself, it will never go away. It's going to keep continuing, okay? So you have to get adults involved. If adults do not know what's happening, then they cannot help you. So that's why you must tell an adult and you must never, ever keep it to yourself. Skip school or avoid school or after school activities because you're afraid of the bully. So... If it's gotten to this point, then the bully has too much power over you already. No one, no human being, especially a bully, should never have this much power over you that is actually impacting your school activities, okay? That you're skipping schools, okay? You're, you're not participating in class and stuff like that because you're afraid of the bully. It should, they should never have that much power over you. Uh, don't be afraid to tell. Telling is not tattling. This is where we get to this. Uh, and it's the right thing to do. Okay, what's the difference between telling and tattling? There's a difference. Because the bully will say, well, if you're going to tell somebody, you're going to be a snitch. You're going to be a tattletaler, right? So what's the difference between tattling and telling? Yes. Exactly. He's absolutely right. So tattling is your intention is to just to get the person in per, uh, just to get the person in trouble. That's your only intention. Okay. Telling is you're actually relating information for some benefit. Okay. So there's a huge difference. So when a bully tells you, if you go, if you tell somebody you're going to be a snitch, you're going to be a tattletaler. Why do you think they're saying that in the first place? By the way, why do you think they're saying that? Yes. Yeah, they, they don't want you to get in trouble. Uh, they, don't want, they, don't want, they don't want you to get them in trouble. That's the reason. So he's protecting himself or herself. It's protection, okay? So, he, because, so if you do tell, so what you should do is the opposite. You should tell someone because it's the proper thing to do. So whenever the bully tells you that, ignore that immediately because they're just trying to protect themselves. Go ahead. Okay. Obviously, this is very extreme. Like some kids, they do actually start hurting themselves. They start cutting themselves, okay, and things like that because of the bullying, because of the trauma that they're facing because of the bullying. They actually start hurting themselves. And in some very small cases, they actually also commit suicide. I actually just heard about a Muslim girl, 12-year-old, who killed herself because she was being bullied in school a couple of years ago. It happened three or four years ago uh, in Maryland. A Muslim girl, 12-year-old, killed herself because of bullying. So this is a terrible thing, and it should never, a bully should never, or bullies should never have this much impact on your life and this much power on you that you're actually going around and hurting yourself or even to the point of committing suicide. Okay, so now we get to the last slide for the kids, which is if you see someone being bullied, meaning if you actually see someone else being bullied, okay, what you should do. So give me some ideas first. Okay, maybe he already put it up, it's cheating. <laughs> Yes. 
Try to break it up, okay. Try to help them out, yes. Tell a teacher or adult, yes. Same thing, okay. Oh, he always beats you, you gotta be faster. <laughs> okay. Okay, number one is talk to a parent, teacher, or another adult you trust. Again, we get to the adult, we, we get to the trust someone, okay? So if you see someone else being hurt, okay, being bullied, then you have to tell someone as well. You have to get some, you have to get involved. If you're too scared, because a lot of kids, they don't tell someone because they think, oh, if I tell, then the teacher's gonna, then the bully's gonna come after me, okay? You can go to a teacher and tell anonymously, hey, I don't want my name known, I don't want you to say my name, but I saw so-and-so doing such-and-such -such thing to someone else at such-and-such -such location. And I, and I think he was being bullied, you should do something about it. But I'll, please don't say my name, I don't want to get in trouble with the bully as well. So, meaning you do have to tell someone, okay? It's very important. Be kind to the kid being bullied. What is that? Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Okay, so he doesn't think you're a partner. Okay, yes. So the bully doesn't get entertained. Okay, anything else? One more. Yes. Exactly. Okay, good, good. So remember what, what I said that kids who are bullied usually have very low self-esteem. They have very low self-confidence, right? So when a bully is picking on a victim, they're basically degrading, okay? And, sh and basically, basically killing their self-confidence and their self-esteem and of how they feel about themselves. So as soon as you go there and you talk to the kid who was bullied, you're basically, you're building him back up, okay? So the bully was breaking him down, okay, breaking her down. You're going there and you're building them back up. You're rebuilding their self-confidence and, and you are rebuilding their self-esteem and self-image, okay? That's why this is very important because the kid has to feel that they're not alone. They have to feel that they have friends. They have to feel that not everybody in there feels the same way. It's very important for a victim of a bully because it is, tra it is a traumatic experience to have somebody pick on you in that manner. So you have to build them back up. And I have some examples here. Um, so you can do things like you can sit with them at lunch or on bus, talk to them, invite them to do something, make them and make sure that they are that that they, that they do not feel alone. That's why this is why this is so important. Uh, another example. Okay. So so I'll give you a scenario. Okay. If you see somebody else being bullied, now there's two situations. Either you know the bully will not pick on you, okay? Maybe the bully is only interested in that person and constantly picks on that person, not you, okay? In that situation, you should immediately approach the victim and say, hey, are you okay? Hey, don't, hey just ignore him, don't worry about that, okay? It's not true. Or, or just say, or take him away from the situation to a safer location. Hey, hey, come with me. Hey, let's go over there, let's go talk. I have to talk to you about something, okay? Make an excuse. Get the person out of that situation, okay? And go somewhere else. And then talk to them. Hey, are you okay? I know that was really wrong. That's really messed up. I hope he did, uh, I know he was saying terrible things. Hey, don't believe him. He's just being a jerk. Whatever the case is, okay? So take them away from, from the situation to a safer location and build them back up. Uh, then again, if you, if you feel too strong that if I get involved, then he's going to come after me too. Then again, do what I said earlier. Go and, talk, go and tell an adult. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, well, then you try it at least. You, you have to try. You have to try. But then again, but you should report it though. That's a good, that's a very good point. He said, what if the kid who is being bullied, you try to help them out, and maybe in that, sit in that intense moment, they are, they, they are feeling so low, so reduced, and so like helpless, they don't want any help, okay? They're just, they're just gonna push you away. They get away from me. I don't wanna talk to anyone. Yeah, that happens. I've seen that as well. Actually, kids who are victims, you try to help them out, they push the person away. It's not because they don't want help. It's because they're feeling so low at that moment. They're feeling so helpless that they just push you away. So I would say find a more suitable time to talk to them. But definitely you have to still report it to the adult. You have to report it to the adult. Don't say, well, he doesn't want my help, so I guess he's okay. No. If he doesn't want your help, it doesn't matter. You still have to report it to an adult. And make sure that the adult knows about it. Okay, get involved. Um, so... Uh, so research has shown that when kids themselves get involved in their school on an anti-bullying campaign, if they, the kids themselves get involved, it is far more effective. 
than adults preaching at them, hey, don't do, hey, don't do bullying. Why is that the case? Why is it more effective when kids themselves say, we don't want a culture of bullying in our school? Why is it more effective? Why does it work better? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, then the bully will feel lonely. Okay, yes. Anything else? Why does it work more when kids do it themselves? Yes, and the victims have more support. Yes, absolutely. So that's the reason. That's exactly what the reason is, okay? Uh, it's because ki when kids themselves get involved, then there's like a culture of peer pressure, okay? And then there's like a whole culture around the school that we're not going to allow this thing to happen in our school. There's, so the bully has no support. He has no backing. So he doesn't have an audience because bullies also want an audience. When they don't get that audience, then they're, no, they're not going to do that. If the bully feels, it's the bully that should feel uncomfortable. If I do this here, they're going to come after. All the kids are going to turn against me. The main reason bullying continues to happen is all the kids they just sit there and then just watch and they don't do anything. That's the reason it continues. So the bully continues in his behavior or her behavior. So that's why we have to do the opposite. Uh, I have some examples here. Uh, beyond the school safety committee, uh, implement some sort of anti-bullying workshop or campaign at your school, teach students how to get help. So kids can do that. You can talk to your principal and say, hey, I want to run an anti-bullying campaign at the school. Uh, can you help me with it? And honestly, they will be more than happy to, uh, happy to help you with it. And get schools involved, get, uh, get the whole school involved, get everyone involved in your school. Okay, any questions? And this, the next session is for parents. Any, any questions? So mashallah, I was very clear, right? <laughs> Yes. I was just wondering if you were going to include any sort of Islamic sayings to support those kind of things. Like, for example, you know, in uh, the Hadith, you know, if you see something wrong, say it or do something. Yes, yeah, so we can definitely do that. I usually don't because I, I created the workshop for Muslims and non-Muslims both. But, but yes, that's right. So we can use the Hadith as well, absolutely. We know that injustice is wrong in our religion, right? It's not tolerated, right? And injustice uh, is, will be like a form of darkness on the Day of Judgment. A zulm. A zulm is like injustice, right? It'll be a form of uh, darkness on the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet said, uh, whenever you see something evil, try to, try to change it with your hand. If you cannot, then with your tongue. And if you cannot, then, you know, detest it with your heart, which is the least amount of faith. So yes, it is definitely part of faith to stand up for other people, you know, to, uh, uh, to right a wrong in a society, whether in your school, whether at your home, or whether in the community, whatever it is, to right a wrong is a form of worship as well, and it's something that is encouraged in our religion. Hence, Ikna Council for Social Justice, like Muslim-based social justice organization, right? Uh, so we came into existence because of that hadith. So it's, yes, it's very important. So any questions about the bullying? Do you have a question? Okay. What, what, what can a friend do if someone, is if someone is bullying your friend, what you can do? Oh, if the friend, yeah. If the, if, so uh, the, if it's a good friend, what the friend should do is they should tell an adult. They should tell someone. That's the best thing a friend can do. Get an adult involved in the situation, so especially someone that they trust that will take care of the situation and protect the child. Yes. Honestly, now I would say that now they have cameras and stuff in school, right? So they can pick up, okay, who went to the bathroom, who came out of the bathroom. They should be able to, but you have to still give your side of the story. You have to, you have to report it, basically. And then it's, and then it's the school's responsibility to uh, investigate the claim. And it's not like they're just going to hear you out and just say, okay, what's your story? What's your story? Okay, well, we don't have any evidence, so let's just go away. No, they will actually investigate. They'll look at the camera. They'll see who's there. They'll talk to the witnesses who was there. Uh, so they will do a thorough investigation. If it's a good school, they should do a thorough investigation to find out what actually happened. Um, but if you find, if you go into a bathroom and you see a bully and you know this guy has a habit of picking on you, honest, don't go into the bathroom like nothing's going on. No, just, wa just walk out. Just run away. Just get out of the bathroom because you don't want to be in that situation. You know what the first law of self-defense is? What's the first law of self-defense? 
avoiding, avoiding physical confrontation at all costs. That's the first law. It's not like the, somebody uh, did it at a workshop or somewhere else. I said, what's the first law of self-defense? I thought, you hit first. <laughs> no, that's not the first law of self-defense. The first law of self-defense is you avoid the situation, okay? So, you know, have you ever seen a small cat, right? What happens when the cat gets scared? It runs away, right? Because you, you have two options. You either fight or you flight. Okay, that was, those are the two basic fundamentals. Whether you, are you going to fight this person or are you going to flight? And those are basically, this basic self-defense. It's basic self-defense technique that if you are in a situation, you feel like, you know, I might get really, something really bad might happen here. You run out of there. And this is not cowardliness. This is not coward. This is, this is basic self-defense. Okay. <sighs> Okay, so now I talk to the parents, okay? So all the parents now come forward. I'm going to be asking you questions and things like that, okay? Okay, so kids can, are welcome to stay as well, but sometimes they find it very boring. They start falling asleep and stuff because it's mostly, it's mostly catered towards parents. So, in charge. so if you feel bored, you can, are welcome to please leave and then let the parents listen to it, inshallah, okay? Okay, so if your child is being bullied, what you should do with your child is being bullied? Okay, go ahead. Okay, do not tell them to ignore it or suck it up. I have no idea why parents do this. I have no idea why. This, you should, this is very bad advice. You should never do this. Uh, because telling them to ignore it does not end the bullying. It continues it. It never works. And by the way, when your child comes to you and tells you they are being bullied and you tell them to ignore it, be certain that they have already tried ignoring it. The child doesn't usually come up the first time. If the bullying is happening, then it most likely is on a repetitive basis. The bully came and did stuff to them after many times, and now they're reporting it to you. So they've already tried this method, and now they're coming to you for help, and you can't, all you're saying is something they've already tried, and it doesn't work. So you don't tell them to ignore it. Uh, review the school or district policies on bullying and follow the procedure. Okay, you know that packet that, that your kids bring home in the beginning of the year that you never read and sign and you send it back because it's too boring and... Okay, in that packet, okay, there's a section on bullying. Schools have, there's a federal laws in place, okay? All schools must have anti-bullying policies in their school and they have to protect the kids. So in that packet, there's a guideline of, hey, uh, if your child is being bullied, these are the steps you can take. If you do not see it in your booklet, you should call the school and you should tell them, hey, I don't see an anti-bullying policy in your school. What is your policy? If my child is being bullied at school, what, can I, what are you going to do to protect my child? And number, and number two, what should I do? What steps should I take? And you have to have those. Why are they so important? So a parent tell me, why is that so important? Why is that important? What's that? I can't, I can't see. To avoid, bullying. to avoid bullying. Okay. Anything else? Why do you need to know the policy of the school? To hold accountable. Yes. This is what happens. If something seriously, I mean, God forbid, something serious happens to a kid, the, the bully breaks his arm or really severely hurts him, and now the school is in the media, the first thing the school is going to do is protect itself. It's going to say, oh, we have an anti-bullying policy and their parents never followed it. That's the first thing they're going to say, okay? That we have an anti-bullying policy at our school, we have a very particular procedure and the parents did not follow it. So you have to know it, okay? You have to know it, you need to, you need to know it inside out. So, and you must follow it, even document it. And so if, when your kids come home and they complain about bullying, you need to know the procedure, you need to follow the procedure, and you need to document everything because it's all evidence. Because if it times to come to sue the school, you have everything documented. Here's the email I sent to the teacher telling him, hey, my kid came home, he complained about bullying, and this is the principal's email. You know, I did all the things that they said, I, I, I did all the things that are in their policy, and they still did not protect my kid. So you have to know this policy. Inform the school about your concerns right away. Yeah, absolutely. If your kid comes home, you immediately tell the teacher in, which, in the classroom in which it took place, hey, my kid came home, this is what he said or she said, I need to know what you're doing to protect my kid. And don't be like iffy about it, like, uh, you know, he came home, I don't know if it's real or not. No, be confident, okay? Be confident and firm. Because otherwise, because a lot of these teachers, they've witnessed bullying so much, they've, they've become desensitized to it, 
okay? They don't feel it. They just think it's like everyday behavior. They don't take it seriously. So you as a parent have to go in and actually be firm. I actually gave this class yesterday and the sister came up to me and she said that her six-year-old said that there were some girls in the class picking on her, telling her, oh, your God is not like our God. You can't come to my house and all this thing. And so she complained to the teacher and the teacher said, oh, they're just kids. All kids do this. Uh, this is very inappropriate behavior. We wouldn't expect, if, if, imagine if in an adult situation, if an adult, if an adult did said that to another adult at work, right? Oh, your God is not like my God. You can't come to my party because you're Muslim and blah, blah. I mean, that's very problematic, right? So if it's not okay for adults, why is it okay for a child to do that? So meaning the teacher has become desensitized. This is here in Dallas, by the way, in a public school. Yesterday, she told me. And so I told her how, to, so, what, uh, so my only thing is because she went to the teacher very wishy-washy. Like, you know, hey, I, she came home. She wasn't, she wasn't really being confident about it. She's like very iffy about it. But there was another sister sitting next to her. She said, you know what? I had the same situation when my kids were in school. I went up to the sister. I said, no, absolutely not. I will, never, I will not tolerate this behavior uh, for my kid. I wanted you to take care of it and make sure this doesn't happen again. And it stopped. So she was much more firm and confident. Okay? So you have to bring it to the attention of the teacher immediately. If bullying does not stop or the authority does not do anything. So a lot of parents ask about this. They said, okay, well, we complained to the teacher. She didn't do anything. What can I do now? Well, there's something you can do, okay? You have to go up the chain. Okay, memorize this thing like it's a formula, like a math formula, okay? Now, number one is you go to the teacher. The teacher doesn't do anything. The, the kid is still being bullied. You go to the principal. You complain to the principal. And you, by the way, you, you document everything, okay? Uh, so you, if you call the principal, for example, you talk to them, you meet them in person, you document it, uh, and then you follow up with email. I came to you last year about my kid, what have you done about it, okay? If the principal even doesn't do anything, go to the superintendent, okay? By this time, uh, they get pretty serious, okay? But if, it's, if that also doesn't work, you can go to the school board. The school board has constantly meetings, or you can even find out the school board person for your district in the community and contact that person and say, hey, my kid is being uh, bullied, or even go to the school board meeting. I think they have, actually they do have periodical meetings throughout the year. Go to the meeting and they're free. You can just go attend and say, my kid is being bullied at one of your schools and I've complained, I've, I've complained to the teacher, the superintendent, the principal, I followed their policy, my, it's still happening and they're not doing anything about it. Okay? And by this time, they will try to get somebody involved. If it still doesn't work, okay, you can go to the government. You can go to the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Justice, Justice's Civil Rights Division, write a formal complaint. And all that data you have gathered right now, right, the documentation, that's all evidence now. You give it to them and they will assign a caseworker free of cost to go and investigate the school. Because there are federal laws in place to protect kids from bullying. And if the school is not doing their job, then it's the issue of the government. They have to take care of it. And so by this time, they will get really serious, okay? And they'll start taking the concerns seriously. So this is all, this is, so you can go all the way up to the U.S. government. Next. Okay, now, if your child is the bully, this is a fun one, because a lot of parents are like, oh, it's not my child, absolutely not. No, your child could be a bully too. If the right circumstances are in place, your child could also be a bully as well. So if your child is the bully, what to do? Okay, make it clear that their behavior is unacceptable, it will have consequences, and it needs to stop immediately. You have to be very clear with them from the beginning. Hey, this is not appropriate behavior. We don't like this in the house. Uh, we're not going to tolerate this from you, and you need to stop immediately. They need to be clear that their parents are serious about this, okay? That my parents don't like this type of behavior in school. Then they must be clear. Follow through with consequences. So some, a lot of parents, that, so no, they get complaints about their kids being rough or being bullying other kids. They say, oh, you know what? When I get home, I'll take care of it. When they go home, nothing happens. Okay, they just go back to their normal life. That's not good. If your kids feel that my parents never follow through with their consequences, they'll keep doing it because they will never take you seriously. You have to follow through with the consequences. If you tell your child, if you do such and such, we're going to punish you with such and such, and they do that, you have to punish. Because otherwise, they will not take you seriously and they will not change their behavior. Help them recognize how it's making the victim feel. This is very important. They have to empathize with the victim. They have to feel empathy. What would, what would, how, so you need to sit down with the child and tell him or her, how would you feel if someone did that to you? You were hurting that person. You were hurting their feelings. You were harming them, making them feel miserable about themselves. Why would you do such a thing? What if somebody, if they have siblings, what would, how would you feel if somebody did that to Muhammad or Fatima, for example, right? Your older or younger sister. 
uh, or brother. How would you feel? Oh, I wouldn't like that. Okay, well, she doesn't like that either. He doesn't like that either. So why would you do that? So you need to make them feel how it feels to be in their shoes. Encourage them to perform an act of kindness. So when a child is basically bullying other kids, right, uh, they're having some sort of a negative high off of it. They're, so they're having this negative impact on another child and it's, making, it's giving them some sort of entertainment, some sort of pleasure, basically. So you're trying to reverse that psych. So take them to a soup kitchen, help, uh, make, them help, you know, help, make them help at the masjid, for example, or feed the homeless, okay? Whatever it is, but they need to feel that I can contribute in a positive manner in my society and have a positive impact on someone's life or in, my, in my community and still have that high that you get, that small pleasure from having an impact on someone else's life. Okay, so, that, so you need to reverse that psychology. So get them involved in, uh, you know, um, volunteer work and helping others. Ask them to reflect on why they are doing it. You need to sit down with the kid and you need to ask them deeply, deep questions. You need to interrogate. What's happening? Where did you learn this behavior? Why are you doing this? And maybe that's when all the skeletons will come out. Oh, mom, uh, you know, my older brother picks on me all the time. Well, you don't have a problem with it. Why do you have a problem with it when I do it to other kids at school? Or, you know, uh, uh, my older sister does it to me all the time. You never say anything to her. So why do you care if I do it to someone else at school? So, or maybe they'll say, oh, mom, my, my friends made me do it. So now you know they're in bad company, right? So need to, you need to separate them from your friends, from those types of friends. So, meaning you need to investigate what's causing this learned behavior, okay? It's not something natural to them. What's causing them to behave that way? There's some reasons behind it. Okay, if there are anger issues, you need to teach them to control it. So, some kids, they have anger management issues. It's something, uh, some kids that just have that. Maybe it's, maybe it's because of some sort of trauma, or it could be just something natural. In that case, you need to get them a counselor or a therapist and so they can resolve, so they, they can learn to control their anger. And as parents, it's our duties to find out if our children have anger management issues or not. If they do, then they have to get help. They have to get help. Just like if your child gets sick, you take them to a doctor. If your child has anger management issues, you need to take them to a counselor so they can learn to manage that anger in a healthy way. Uh, if some kids have communication issues, okay, uh, they don't know how to communicate with other kids. You know when your kids are very young, uh, you know when they first start interacting with other kids, they're very possessive about things, right? This is mine. This is mine. This is Baba's. Don't touch that. This is my Baba's, right? And they say, hey, hey, share, share, right? We tell our kids, share, okay? You have to get along with each other. So there are a lot of parents who never teach those things to their kids. So their kids have never learned how to communicate and work with other kids, how to have a, basically how, how to have a healthy relationship with other people, how to share with other people. They don't know how to compromise with other kids because this life is all about compromise, right? You're not going to get everything you want in life. That's never going to happen, right? So you have to learn to compromise. So you have to teach them communication skills. So if your kid is suffering from communication skills, again, you're gonna, you might have to get them a therapist or you might have to get them a counselor, but they need to work through and you need to teach them how to communicate properly with other kids because they don't know. Okay, if low self-confidence, then help them feel better about themselves, right? So I said earlier that because some kids who have low self-confidence, they get bullied, all right? There's the opposite trend too, okay? Where because a kid has such low self-confidence, the only way he or she feels confident is by picking on other kids and bullying other kids and making them feel miserable and makes them feel good about themselves. So if that's the case, and that's what's causing the kid to bully, then you basically you have to uh, basically cr uh, increase their self-confidence. And we'll talk about that in a, in a different slide, inshallah, how to do that. Okay, know their friends. Okay, so as parents, it is your duty to know who your kids are hanging out with. You have to know. It's, it's the right, it's proper thing to do. You need to know who their friends are, who they are. You, need, you should know them by name, what kind of people they are, what kind of friend, people these kids are. If they're, in, if they're good company for your kid or not, if they're having a good influence on your kid or not. And if you decide or if you feel rightly, not unjustly, but likely you've done the investigation, you know the evidence, maybe the other kids are known to be very bullish and things like that or very troublemakers, and you decide that this these, these kids are not right or this particular person is not right company for my child, you have every right to bar that relationship or at least... Uh, minimize it to the best of your ability because they might still see each other at school 
but minimize it to the best of your ability because you're trying to protect your child from bad influence, okay? Just like we would protect anything else, or any type of other type of harm coming to our children, we also, this is also a type of protection we have to do. We have to protect and shield our kids from bad influences, okay? And if friends can be that as well. So just because you're doing your job at home, being a good parent and putting good values in your house, does not mean other kids' parents are doing the same thing with their kids. And if their kids are corrupt, they might also corrupt your kids as well. So you have to create a bar of some sort between those types of friends and uh, your child. Okay, what parents can do. So this is basically, I have general advice. Uh, lead by example and respect others. So parents are the first school for their children. And if they see you disrespecting each other, okay, or disrespecting other people, then don't expect them to go out and respect other people, okay? Because that's what my mom and dad do. Why can't I do it? So you have to lead by example. You have to be the person you want your child to be. Uh, teach them positive, nonviolent responses to abusive behavior. So you have to teach your children how to respond in a positive manner. If something abusive, something wrong has to ha uh, happen to them, you don't want them. You don't want to teach them that just immediately go to violence if something happens to you. If some kid picks on you, just punch him in the face. That's the horrible advice. You should never give that advice. Okay? So you need to find ways uh, for your children to respond to abusive behavior behavior in a nonviolent manner. Okay, b build in them strong self-confidence and s positive self-image, okay? And uh, actually, I have one example of that. Uh, enroll them in a self-defense class. I'll talk about this more in the next slide, but uh, self-defense is a great way to build self-confidence in children and also be very disciplined. Create a loving home and environment, okay? So all children want a loving home and an environment, okay? So you have to make sure that there's respect in the house. And I think I have some examples here. Uh, treat them with respect, no physical or emotional abuse, actively listen to your children. Don't say like, put them off like there's nobody, like I don't care about your opinion. No, listen to them. Sometimes they have very good input that, oh, you know what, you know, my two-year-old like says sometimes something, she sometimes says things, I'm like, oh, well, that's a very good point. I didn't think of it like that, okay, because I, I, because I try to listen to her. Do not allow mistreatment, meaning if you see some sort of abusive behavior between your kids, okay, then you have to stop it. You, as a parent, you have to stop it. Say, hey, don't do that in the house. That's not, that's not right. That's wrong. And don't do it outside the house either. It's not appropriate behavior, okay? Uh, allow expression of opinion. You should hear your kids' opinions uh, out, okay? And if they're valid and they're able to handle it, then you should basically help encourage those opinions. Don't think that just because they're kids, their opinions don't matter. Okay, because that makes them feel really bad about themselves and it basically lowers their self-confidence. So you have to encourage and build them up. Create a culture of accountability. Again, your kids must know and understand that if I do something wrong, I, there are consequences for me when I come to my house. My parents will punish me uh, uh, if, I don't, if I do something wrong. If they don't feel that in the house, then they're not going to change their behavior. Recognize and look for signs which may indicate that your child is being bullied. So I mentioned some of them earlier, right? If your kids' eating patterns change, their sleeping patterns change, their academic performance changes, right? Uh, um, or they enjoyed an activity a lot, now they suddenly hate it, right? So these are signs that your kid might be being bullied. And there are so many other signs that you can download on the internet. You can look, up, look them up. And basically, you should, as parents, we should study those signs. Okay? We should know them so we can recognize it. You know, maybe there is something going on at school that we're not aware of. Get to know the staff of the school. So you should know everybody at your school. You should know the teacher, the principal, the, uh, uh, the security, even the security guards and stuff like that. You should, every, you should know who is working at your school. And one of the best ways to do that and I think, is to get involved in the PTA. I don't know why parents don't get it, in, like, at least in the Muslim community, parents don't, go to, don't become part of the parent-teacher association. This is the only way for you to know what's going on at your school. What's the culture like? What's happening? What's being thought? Uh, what's the latest scandal? Okay? What's, what's happening at the school? That, this is the only way, only way for you to know. So get involved. I would even say uh, 
run for president, be the only brown person in a sea of white women running for president at, at the PTA, okay? So just like, because they're the only ones that are usually involved in this thing, okay? But this is, I don't, I don't know why our community neglects it. Inshallah, I mean, my daughter is too right now. When she goes to school, I definitely want to get, I want to actually, I want to be the, that brown guy that's running for president <laughs> in the PTA uh, amongst this sea of women. So inshallah, so let's see what happens. But the point is that get involved in the PTA, okay? You should know what's going on in your child's school and this is the way to get involved. Teach self-protection techniques. Okay, again, very important. You should role play, okay? If you have, if you have multiple kids and tell them, okay, you, you be the bully, you be the victim, and actually play it out, have them play it out and roll it out, like how are you gonna respond to bullying? Okay, and, and, they, and you can find these like online as well, like sample ones that you can practice with your kids. If you only have one kid, then you can become the bully and make the children, child the victim and just kind of practice with them, okay? Because practice makes perfection, right? So, when, so there's, get them to the point where um, if they go to school, something happened, you know, they will say, you know, I've done this training with my baba and mama. I know exactly what to do. Okay, in this situation, I have to go tell a parent. I have to ignore the bully. I have to not say anything. I have to just sh not, I have to not, I have to not react in any way or in any form. So meaning, you need to train your kids and have them practice in a role play fashion. Okay, so this is my last slide on parents. How to raise self-confident kids. Okay, so inshallah. Help them develop competence. What is competence? What is competence? A parent tell me. Being competent at something. Skillful. Anything else? Confident about it, okay. So competence basically means being good at something. You're, you're good at it. He's very competent at his job, meaning he's really good at it, right? So you, every child, they have certain qualities, okay? Not all children are the same, right? Every child has their own talent, their own specialty, something they're interested in. So you need to find that and make them competent in that quality that they have, that they're naturally good at, okay? And you need to build it because that helps their self-confidence. It raises their self-confidence and their self-esteem. So find that talent, and it's our job as parents to find it and harness it and grow it, that, that natural talent that they have, whatever that is. Uh, let them take healthy risks. So some parents are overprotective over their kids. They, let them, they don't let them do anything. No, no, you're going to get hurt. No, 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 you no, 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 I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. That's not good. You have to let your kids take healthy risks. You know when your child is very young and they get on the slide and they can barely hold themselves together, you have to hold them, right? And after a while, the child does this, right? After a hand, oh, I'm learning this now with my two-year-old, but now she's like, no, don't touch my hand. I can do it myself, right? As, as first, you're kind of scared, like, uh, but then you, just, you know, like my wife is more cautious, right? So she'll still hold on, but I'm like, okay, let's try it out. Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, so you let them take those risks because it's, it builds their self-confidence. You have to teach them to learn to take healthy risks because that is the only way they will build themselves. If you constantly over, be overprotective over them, then they will never learn to take risks because when the bully comes and basically picks on them, to go and tell an adult, despite the bully saying they're gonna be a snitch, that's a risk. That's a risk your child is taking, okay? And if they've never learned as children how to take risks, then they will never take risks when they get older. They'll always be that, oh, I don't want to take risks. I'm too scared. I can't do it. Because they never learned. Because you were so overprotective, you never let them grow in that manner. So it will always allow them to take healthy risks. Uh, make them feel loved and secure. Meaning, every child wants these two fundamental things. They want love and they want security. Okay? And they seek that at home and from their parents first and foremost. Okay? And if they don't get it here, they'll go out and find it somewhere else. That's why we, a lot of these gang members that we, talk, that we hear about, right? one of the main reasons they join a gang is for security and for, for that bond, for that love. You know, because they, they have each other's back, they're very well connected, you know, they're protect, they protect each other, that's what it is. So if they don't find that at home, then two, one of two things will happen. Either, be, either, either they will become a bully or they will become a victim of bullying. So make sure you're providing love and security to your child at home. Okay, do not overpraise. Okay, some parents, they overpraise their kids. They, they, they overdo it too much. If you do it too much, then that's not good. Praise should always be two things. Number one, offer appropriate praise. It should be specific and earned. Your child gets an A at school. 
You say, MashaAllah, you worked very hard, you totally earned it, good job. It's very specific and it's very earned. Okay, it's earned. So, it's, so it shouldn't be for meaningless stuff. Okay, like, oh, you pooped today, that's such a great job. No, that's not something you praise something about, someone about. Number two, focus should be the effort, not fixed quality. Why is that important? Why should the praise should focus the effort? So a child gets an A at school, you worked really hard, you totally deserve it, great job. And not the result or the qualities. Why, why should we not focus, when it, when it comes to praise, why should we not focus on the result but only the effort? The focus. Yes. Exactly. You will... Just because you put in the effort for something, does that mean you're going to get it the result that you want? No. You have to teach. If you constantly keep praising the result, then your children are going to learn that the only way to get ahead in life is to get the proper result that you want. So meaning ends justify the means. So they will want the result no matter what, even if it means cheating other people, stepping on other people. That's what they will be learning because that's, that's the only way they've learned that the, the results justify the means. You don't want that mentality. And also, kids who are constantly focused on results or parents who constantly make their kids focus on the results, what happens is if they don't get the result that they want, then their self-esteem goes down. Their self-confidence goes down. So, but if you focus on the effort, then you're teaching your child that it's the effort that matters. You may not get the result, but it's the, it's the effort. So the, the kid will say, oh, you know what? Um, I didn't get an A this time, but inshallah, maybe I'll work harder next time. I'll study more. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll review my stuff. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I missed something, and, you know, and then I'll do better next time. That's the mentality you want to build because that's coming from a confident kid. That mentality is coming from a self-confident kid as opposed to the other one. Oh, you know, I didn't get the grade I wanted. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I'm not good. Okay, that's not the type of mentality you want to build in children because that's not good for their self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you an ex even an Islamic example for that one. You know, we have the famous hadith of the Prophet that uh, a person who recites the Quran beautifully, he gets his reward, but the one who struggles he gets double the reward. We know this hadith, right? So even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He focuses on the effort. He doesn't care about the result because the result is from Him. But Allah wants you to put in the effort. So the same thing. So effort is what counts, what is more important. Okay, let them make their own age-appropriate choices. So this is very much connected with healthy risks. So obviously, you don't want them to get into something. So have, have health, let them take healthy risks, but make sure they're age appropriate for them. Okay. So if it's too much, then you have to tell them, no, you can't do this. Because what happens is if they try to do it and they become overwhelmed, then it's going to kill their self-confidence. So as parents, you have to recognize, can my child handle this? Yes or no? If they can't, you can say, okay, you know what? Hey, sweetie, you, I would love for you to do this, but you're not ready yet. In a few years, we can do it. We can definitely do it. I will help you out, whatever it is. But right now, you're not ready. You're too young. Whatever the case is, okay? So make sure it's age appropriate. Let them help around the house. This is very important. Give your kids duties around the house, okay? Help with the kitchen. Um, uh, help wash dishes. Help cook food, okay? Help clean the house. Whatever it is. You know, my two year old, uh, sometimes when I'm taking the dishes from the drying rack and putting it back, she comes running and she wants to help me. So she'll take it out of the drying, she'll hand it to me. And, she'll, and when she's done, she has this big, proud face on her face, like, I did something to help Baba. Like, she's very proud of herself. It's really good for her self-confidence, right? It feels like, I committed. I contributed in the house somehow. I made a difference. So this is very good for their self-confidence. So give your kids something to do, both boys and girls, okay? Give them, like, help, make them help them. Uh, also responsibility, it also comes under responsibility. Give your kids responsibility around the house because it also teaches a competence and it teaches self-confidence and self-esteem as well. Um, encourage them to pursue their interests. So like I said, all children have certain qualities and certain talents. And once you find those, you need to make sure you make them pursue, encourage them to pursue it even further, okay? So your child is really good at sports, say, hey, you, and you see that, you notice that they're really good at basketball, or they're really into basketball, tell them, hey, why don't you join a basketball team? Okay, I'll help you out. Let's go find a league or something in the, in the community, a youth league, and we'll put you in there. And make them part of that. You cut, your kid is very much into science, for example. You say, hey, why don't you join the science club? Okay, or we'll find like science club meetings in the area and make your kid go there. So whatever that interest is, you need to know it, understand it, and harness it, and encourage them to pursue it as well. Because again, very good for their self-confidence. 
Okay. Okay, so there will be times when the child will fail and they will struggle, okay? In that situation, you have to make clear to them that you love them regardless, okay? That you love them regardless. They need to understand that, okay? Because if you constantly, if you only praise them when they do something successfully, then they will feel that my parents only love me for my success, not for who I am. And that's not a good feeling for a child to have. Because then, then every time they will fail, they will feel low. Oh, my parents don't love me. They don't, they don't like me. So, uh, so, my, oh, so just like my, my dad only loves me when I do well at the basketball court. My mom only loves me when I get an A on my test. Otherwise, she doesn't really care. Yeah, that's not the type of mentality you want to build in a, in a child, right? So if they fail or they struggle, say, hey, so your child comes home, they, they, uh, they, got, they, they fail their exam, for example, right? They say, and, but you saw it with your eye that they were working for it, they were studying, they studied hard, but they still failed. So rather than yelling at them, screaming at them, say, hey, you know what? I saw you, you worked really hard, don't worry about it, I still love you, I still care about you, uh, we'll just try again next time, just don't worry about it, inshallah, next time we'll try harder. Okay, we'll just go over the questions, maybe we missed something, but don't worry about it, inshallah, next time. Uh, so, so again, this is when you actually saw this happen, okay? Obviously, if the child was negligent, okay, um, or lazy, and they didn't study and they got the field, then you have the right, then you have the right to punish them or you know, say, but well, you know, you didn't put the work in it. But uh, like I said, if they actually put in the work and they struggled and they still failed, then you have to make it clear to them that, uh, you, that, you, that you still love them regardless. Okay, ban harsh criticism, okay? okay? I see this all the time. Like, why can't you be more like your sister? Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be, look at such and such and son, okay? So-and-so's son is like this. So-and-so's daughter is like this. Why would you say something like that? Why would you create that rivalry even between your children? That's a horrible thing to say to your kids. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard of families, brothers and sisters, who haven't talked to each other for decades because their parents put them in this rivalry when they were kids, and now they're older, they hate each other. Okay? I hate him. He was always my dad's favorite. I hate her. She was always my mom's favorite. I hate her. So, so why would you create that type of rivalry? Every child is different. Just because one child is really good at something doesn't mean the other child has to be a copycat. Okay? So they all have their own talents and their own interests. So pursue that. So don't create this type of rivalry between siblings or compare them. So uh, no, bad, no harsh criticism. Similarly, I mean, I've heard of like uncles telling their nieces, oh, you're too fat. Who's going to marry you? Like, like, like a small, why would you say that to someone? That's a horrible thing to say. Oh, I'm just joking. Well, yeah, you're joking, but she's not taking it as a joke. Because she, yeah, she did happen to be overweight, right? And then, but, but, but why, this is a horrible thing to say. Oh, you're never good. You're all, you were always dumb. You're such a dumb kid. Okay, you have to, you know, you're, you're this, you're, so no harsh criticism. Because why? It kills their self-confidence. If, if their own parents don't believe in them, why would the world believe in them? That's how they're going to feel. My own parents think I'm a loser. My own parents think I'm a loser. So what about the world? So they're gonna, that's going to be really bad for them. Let them help others and give. Okay, I gave this example earlier about uh, how you have to change their psyche, right? So you have to help them give. Okay, so once they give, it makes them feel good about themselves. Okay, whenever we give to someone, you know, even as adults, we, here we go to a soup kitchen, and we have these homeless people come in and you give them food and they're smiling and they say, thank you, God bless you, God bless you. It makes you feel good about yourself, does it not? It makes us feel good about ourselves. We did something good, right? There's a homeless man on the street, he was asking for money and you give him money, he said, oh, God bless you, thank you so much, thank you so much. You feel good about yourself. Same thing with kids. So teach them to give to the masjid, teach them to give to uh, causes, you know, or, or, or drives, or food drives, or make them, uh, or, or give them like projects, like, hey, why don't you collect $1,000 for the homeless overseas, or uh, the food drive that's happening overseas for kids in Syria. Okay, I'll give you this project. And they go around and they collect the money from their friends, from their family, from the masjid, they, you know, they stand outside the masjid and say, hey, please give to the masjid, whatever the case is. But it's really good for their self-confidence. Okay, so that was the last slide. So these are some more resources I have here. Uh, the first one is ours, iknasiyashya.org slash stopbullying. We have far more material and research on there. We actually had uh, professional academics and researchers in the field of bullying. We, there, was a lady that we, uh, there was a lady that we interviewed that we brought in to do a webinar for us. She's doing her PhD 
in religious bullying, kids who are bullied in school because of religious reasons. How, do, how, many, how often do you find someone who's doing a PhD in religious bullying? It's very, it's like unheard of, right? But that's what she's doing her PhD in. So she did a webinar for us and we invited four or five other speakers and academics and scholars on the topic of bullying. So it's all on the website that we recorded it and it's there. The second one is no bullying app. This is actually an app you can download on your Android and you can also download it on your iPhone. So it gives very practical advice on how to talk to your kids about bullying, okay? How to identify bullying, what happens if a kid is bullied, what to do, what not to do, things like that. So it's a very comprehensive app, okay? And it was released by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services. And it's a very good app. I would highly doc uh, recommend you to download it and go through it. And then after learning through it, go and sit down with your kids and talk, to, talk about it. Uh, Stopbullying.gov. Uh, this is the official government website on bullying. Um, Nobullying.com. Uh, ING is a Muslim organization. I think they did a workshop here as well. They have a website. They've done some anti-bullying stuff. You can uh, see that as well. Stompoutbullying.org. So there are a lot more resources, but these are the ones that I personally have engaged with to a certain level. So these are very good research resources. Um, the last point I will make before ending is that when you go home and you have kids, sit down with them and in a very serious and uh, kind manner, say, hey, I want you to be honest with me. If you were bullied at school, would you tell me or not? Sit down with them and talk to them, okay? I say, and make it clear, I'm not going to judge you, I'm not going to say anything, I just want to know. And, if they say, and, and see what they say and have that conversation with them about bullying and what I just talked about today is go into a deeper level of discussion with them and then don't let them hang on or just like rely on their friends or something like that you as parents must be involved so that's it so any questions yes this present this particular presentation no it's not but if you email me I can send it to you so email info at iknasiyasya.org and it goes it, that email comes directly to me and I can send it to you inshallah Yes, so they just recorded this on YouTube. So this is going to be available online as well, this whole presentation. Um, there are a couple of Saudi schools in this area. Do you plan to visit and present this? Yes, I just presented it at ICI. We had 200 kids there. I presented it to them. Uh, I did it at, um, what's the other masjid? VRIC, Valley Ranch Islamic Center. I did there yesterday, last night. Uh, I did it there. Um, but yeah, I, I know, I mean, they try, we tried to get a few more places, but they weren't available. But yeah, if they're available, we would love to go there and do it as well, definitely. Okay, if you, yeah, if you can set it up with them, go to, have them go to our website, contact me, and uh, definitely we can do it, inshallah. We can do it. We would love to come. Yes. That's a good point. Uh, you know, yesterday when I did this at ICI, and it's a, it's, from my understanding, it's a full-time Islamic school, right? ICI? ICI, yes, it's a full-time Islamic school. So afterward, a kid came up to me and he said, uh, what do I do if my guardians don't take me seriously about bullying? So he's telling me his own story indirectly. He doesn't, he's not saying it directly, but he definitely, he's being bullied at school, and his parents are not taking him seriously, right? So the point is, yeah, you're right. It, is, it does happen in Islamic school as well. As far as advice goes, getting the adults involved is the same procedure for them. But the problem is trying to get the Muslim Islamic school teachers serious about it. Like, they shouldn't be like brushing it off, like, oh, they're just kids. So for that, there has to be some sort of a meeting, of course, like with the teacher, and there should be some sort of, we can definitely, this is a, definitely a first step. I, I was doing it over there, Brother Muqaddim, I think is his name. He really liked the presentation, and I think, like, if, if you have people in the school who are interested in the topic, they can push it. They can push it to the board. They can push it up uh, uh, above. And honestly, there are, we have federal law. We can scare them. We have federal laws in place where they have to have, they have, where they have to protect their children. And if they're not doing that, then you can say, then I have to write a complaint or something like that. But basically, they should be told that, they have, you, that you want to protect your child. 
And in most cases uh, that I've come across, uh, if you ask them, they will sit, sit down with you, they'll talk to you, and they will say, okay, you know what, Let's, if you have some ideas, we would love to hear it, and they will, and, and they will, they will definitely like to work with you. So, but it, it, like I said, but it varies from school to school. So it, but uh, the first step definitely is to have them sit down and go through a presentation like this so they actually understand what's going on, because even they have some, a lot of misconceptions of what bullying is, and how serious it is, because they don't, also don't, do not know. The only thing, oh, it only happens in public schools because where all the non-Muslims are, right? Because they're picking on our kids. No, you're, in your own school, that's happening as well. Any other questions? Okay, so, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for coming. So if you have any personal questions, you can come and talk to me, inshallah, after, and then that's it. Jazakallah khair for coming. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum. I uh, just want to say Jazakallah khair to the Ikna Council of Social Justice and also Brother Ramiz for conducting, conducting that uh, beautiful uh, presentation and workshop. Uh, for those of you who are leaving, uh, please do stop by the table in the back, brothers and sisters, and please do get some snacks and refreshments. Uh, but yeah, Jazakallah khair and may Allah SWT reward you. And uh, inshallah, the recording is on the YouTube uh, channel of Epic Masjid. Um, he did mention his email address. I think some of you who may, have not, may not have gotten it, we will post it in the description of that YouTube video. And the entire presentation as well, um, I'll ask him to have a link for that so you can download it. And the video itself, of course, will have the whole presentation as well with his voice in the background. So, Jazakallah khair to all of you for attending. I hope it was beneficial. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum.